as a privilege, but that privilege has since been withdrawn. The government giveth, and the government taketh away. All across Western Europe, from Sweden to Britain, from Germany to Austria, citizens are being singled out and harassed for what they say. They are being put under surveillance by the state. They lose their jobs, they are being prosecuted, and when they are convicted, they are fined and sometimes even sent to prison. But by now you're probably wondering what it is that people are saying that gets them in so much trouble with the state. Are they fomenting insurrection? Are they threatening to assassinate the political leaders? Are they inciting violence? Or a rebellion even? No. It's nothing as exciting as that. Ordinary, peaceful Europeans who just happen to love their countries are being targeted for criticizing. For criticizing multiculturalism. They are being threatened with legal action for questioning their country's immigration policies. You've probably heard of the so-called European refugee crisis, which has been underway since the beginning of last summer. Europe is being inundated with immigrants from the Middle East and Africa, most of them Muslims. During the past year upwards of a million migrants entered Germany, Germany alone. Sweden, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Austria, including Italy, of course, have also seen a huge surge in immigration. I just now saw, uh, as I was checking uh, the Austrian news online, that Austria is now officially up 56% of immigrants as compared to last year. As a result, there has been a, has been a rapid spike in the crime rate in all of these countries, especially crimes against women and girls. Harassment, groping, molestation, and rape. Public swimming pools in Germany have become notorious as hunting grounds for young Muslim males who prey on women, young girls, and little boys. Even old women, as old as 70, have been raped in Austria. The horrible fact is that molestation and rape have become everyday occurrences in Austria, in Germany, and all over the place. Conscientious Europeans are objecting, objecting to immigration. This is why ordinary citizens are questioning the wisdom of allowing Islam into Europe. And this is why the state is cracking down on free speech, because there must be no criticism, no questioning, no objections to Islamization. The European establishment, for reasons known best to itself, has decided not to address the systemic problem represented by Muslim immigration, but rather suppress any and all criticism, or even discussion, of the issue. As far as elites are concerned, the policy has been decided. It has been fixed in place, and there is no going back. The fact that most Western European countries will have Muslim majorities in 50 years is of no concern to our leaders. They and their families live in gated communities far from the mean streets of Sharia zones where gang violence is the norm. They will never have to experience the joys of multiculturalism directly. Why should they care? This is the backdrop behind the crackdown on free speech in Europe. Ten years ago, when I started being a part of this movement, there were hardly any prosecutions of hate speech. Five years ago, there were several dozen such cases, including my own. I used... Excuse me. We have to understand that there can, that there can be no longer any doubt that our political leaders have become traitors to their own people. This is especially true of the unelected and unaccountable leaders who run the totalitarian apparatus of the European Union in Brussels. <laughs> Their immigration policy is being shoved down the throats of the member states of the European Union's Union without any regard for the opinion of the national governments or the European people. As I mentioned earlier, activists are being arrested and prosecuted all over Europe. For instance, my friend Gerd Wilders, 
the leader of the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands. is the most prominent example. He will go on trial for the third time this fall. I also refer to Dan Park in Sweden and Tommy Robinson in England. Tommy is also a very courageous man and he has actually spent prison time. Other examples are Jussi Halao in Finland, Michael Stürzenberger in Germany and Lars Hedegaard in Denmark. My friend, Paul Weston, was arrested for publicly quoting Winston Churchill's words about Islam. That is how bad it has become, and that is how bad it is. Now, I will describe very briefly my own case, which is fairly typical of what is happening in these days. In 2008, I began a series of seminars in Vienna under the auspices of the Austrian Freedom Party explaining to members and other interested parties what Islam, the Quran, and the Hadith really teach, along with basic tenets of Islamic law. In my presentations, I discuss the consequences for democracy, freedom, and human rights today. Because of the success of my seminars, they drew the attention of leftists who were and are still determined to discredit and destroy anybody who dares to criticize Islam. To them, we are racist, racist, fascist, Islamophobes. And without my knowledge, an Austrian magazine sent a reporter to one of these seminars to make a secret recording of it. As a result, in late November of 2009, a criminal complaint was filed against me for hate speech under Article 283 of the Austrian Criminal Code. From an Austrian left-wing perspective, my crime was made worse by the fact that my seminars were held under the auspices of the Freedom Party. The complaint against me was not filed by the state, but rather by this magazine, the publication, the publication whose reporter had infiltrated my seminar. For the next 10 months, the possibility of a formal charge was left hanging over my head, but I, left, I received no official word. All I did was hire a judge. A judge, I'm sorry. A lawyer, of course. No, I did not hire a judge just then. So after I gave a deposition uh, to the Office of the Prote Protection of the Constitution, I heard absolutely nothing from the prosecutor's office. But later that year, I learned that a formal charge would be filed against me. And a few, late, a few days later, I even received official notice from the court that my date, trial date would be in November of 2010. Now comes the interesting part. So all of you lawyers in here, listen up. You won't believe what happened. During my trial, the issue of pedophilia came up in light of Muhammad's status as the perfect example for Muslims as stated in Quran 33, 21. I explained what the Hadith collections are and that they constitute an indispensable part of Islamic scripture. I emphasized that I had made up nothing of what I had said, but simply quoted canonical Islamic scripture concerning Muhammad's conduct, including his marriage to a little girl named Aisha. The trial was then adjourned until the following Janu uh, January 2011. At the second hearing, excerpts of the recording were played back, of the recording of the seminar were played, played back, and it was, became very clear that there was no hate speech whatsoever. The judge discussed my statement that the conduct of Muhammad is exemplary for Muslims and took particular issue with the statement, and I'm quoting myself here, what exactly would it be called today if not pedophilia, which was a reference to the Prophet's marriage to a six, marriage to a six year old girl, of course. <clears throat> Evidently aware that the charge of incitement to hatred wasn't never going to fly, the judge, at her own discretion, eventually announced a new charge. Denigration of religious teachings of a legally recognized religion. My defense was unprepared for this, and so we requested that the trial be adjourned. When the court reconvened, events moved swiftly to a close. 
The judge decided that the language used in my seminars did not in any way incite hatred, but utterances regarding Mohammedan pedophilia were punishable. In particular, the judge found that the use of pedophilia was factually incorrect, and this is a sexual preference solely or de mainly directed towards children. The judge stated that this cannot apply to Muhammad, who was still married to Aisha when she attained the age of 18. Thus, I was not found guilty on the charge of incitement to hatred, but guilty on the charge of denigration of religious beliefs of a legally recognized religion. I was fined 480 euros, which is equivalent uh, to about 500 or 510 dollars, and, uh, or, not and, but or, 60 days in prison. The charge, as you will all agree, was ludicrous. Of course, I appealed my conviction to a higher court. The verdict was upheld. Later, we went to the Austrian Supreme Court. Again, judgment was up, verdict was upheld. I have now exhausted all my options within Austria, but the case has now been put before the European Court of Human Rights. It was accepted a year ago, ladies and gentlemen. After five years of waiting, it has now been accepted, and a decision is expected very soon. Whichever way the court decides, the verdict will have implications for citizens throughout Europe and not just for Austrians. If my conviction is overturned, it will set an important precedent for the freedom to criticize religion, religions and religiously sanctioned conduct. And you will hear about it. And if we win, you will hear about it. So hopefully by the end of this year we will know more. And just like you here in the United States, we in Austria are also called to the voting booth again this year. As you may have heard, the results of the recent Austrian presidential elections election had to be annulled due to the possibility of irregularities in the absentee ballots. The candidate of the Freedom Party, Norbert Hofer, was ahead and projected to win until the postal votes were counted. For some mysterious reasons, the Green Party opponent was favored overwhelmingly in the absentee ballots. So we're facing a rerun of the election this fall, and the uh, Freedom Party candidate is once again favored to win, and this time the postal votes will be carefully monitored, so we shall see what happens. The Brexit vote has emboldened the right of center politicians in EU member states to discuss a possible exit from the European Union. Norbert Hofer is one of them. He recently said that the accession of Turkey to the EU would compel Austria to withdraw from the European Union. Thus, the breakup of the European Union is a distinct possibility. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the truth can be considered hate speech. Discussing verifiable facts about Islam, its doctrines, its history, its behavior, the behavior of Muslims in the name of Allah may upset Muslims and incite them to become violent. This proves hate speech has occurred regardless of the truth of what was said. And it means that your right to utter such truths may be restricted. The enforcement of hate speech, of a hate speech regime, thus leads to the denial of the obvious. We deny the origin and meaning of the most evil occurrences around the globe. A Syrian refugee kills his pregnant girlfriend? Keep quiet, otherwise you will be found guilty of hate speech. A Tunisian man kills children by running them over with a truck on the streets of Nice? Better not say or write anything about it for, about this madness if you want to keep your job and stay out of jail. And so we refuse to articulate a message of resistance against the evil we see around us. Our political and social leaders have granted us free speech, but with buts. Yes, we have freedom of speech, but how many times have you heard this before? I believe in freedom of speech, but drawing cartoons of Muhammad is taking it way too far. No one is a stronger supporter of free speech than I am. 
But that doesn't mean you should be allowed to insult another person's religion. Once you apply a but, free speech ceases to be a right. Instead, it becomes a concession to be rationed out by someone in authority who decides where the butts will fall. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot have freedom with butts. You cannot have half freedom, part-time freedom, contingent freedom. You cannot declare your support for free speech, but only defend those parts of it that you like or that meet your preferred set of standards. The First Amendment of the United States Constitution provided a clear, unambiguous commitment to free speech, thereby setting a gold standard for civil liberties that is still unequal anywhere in the world more than 200 years later. This is what I have set my sights on for Austria and Europe. Now, before it's too late, we need to claim our right, reclaim our right to speak freely. Our time is short in Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep us in your prayers. Thank you very much.